It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. Who wants to talk sports on a Monday? We do. From the Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center Studios in San Diego, we welcome you to our Monday bonus podcast. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, along with my co-host who broadcast from Left Field, John Riley, and one of our great friends, the coach John Cantera. We're welcoming you to a unique Monday bonus podcast. Our podcast is brought to you by Dixon Line Lumber and Home Centers, nine stores to serve you in San Diego. You got projects, you should consult with them about ideas as well as the structure of what you want to get done. Dixie Line. And by North County Eye Center of Poway and Escondido, we all need help with our eyes. When that time comes, think North County Eye Center, Poway and Escondido. Full disclosure, spent my whole life doing sports talk radio. Full disclosure, John Riley has been a sports talk junkie. Full disclosure, we've talked about this guy for a long period of time because he's been my teammate. I've been his teammate for a long time, the coach John Cantera. Welcome. This will be different. This will be fun. Uh, it's always fun, Lee. Uh, thanks for you and John having me today. I've been looking forward to coming out here, and uh, what a great setup. Yeah, John's John's got a better TV studio than some of the other TV studios that I've worked in in the San Diego <laughs> market. Hey, before we got started, a couple of business items. One, at the end of our podcast, it's your turn to join us. It's called Fans Forum. John, explain how all the people on our live stream can join us. Yeah, so if you want to get involved in Fans Forum, you got a question for the coach or for Hacksaw, just type it in the live chat on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, and we'll get you involved in Fans Forum at the conclusion of Hacksaw's Headlines. And a reminder, if you like sports, check my website. It's all written every day of the week. Every morning it's posted, leehacksawhamilton.com. And on the homepage, there's a huge orange box. Register to join Hacksaw's Insiders Group as we roll out things we're going to try to get done in 2024. You'll get all types of insight. Want you to subscribe to what we're doing. You'll get the immediate alert, even at two o'clock in the morning. Every time we put something up on our YouTube channel, you will get the alert. And we want you to tell your friends, share, and give us a thumbs up. Give us a five-star rating along the way. That's business. Let's talk sports. John, you got the topics on the table. Where do you want to start? All right. We got to go Padres spring training here. Answers and questions, Lee? Yeah. Let's talk about the Padres. They're getting to the middle of the Cactus League before they leave to go to South Korea to open against the Dodgers. When this thing opened in February, mid-February, questions in left field, questions in center field, question about pitching depth, question about the guys who came. Well, here's the scorecard at the middle of the Cactus League. Michael King, the ex-Yankee, pretty impressive. Drew Thorpe, who has dominated in the minor leagues, really impressive in exhibition games. Randy Vasquez has pitched well in a couple of starts. Adrian Morion's had a couple of one-inning outings, has yet to give up a run. We've seen the flashes of the Japanese and the Korean relievers, Yuki Matsui and Wook So Go. Okay so far, Matsui probably be back on the mound this weekend. The big story is what's going on in the outfield. And they've tried really hard with Jackson Merrill. Jackson Merrill struggled to get above the 200 average offensively at home plate, but he's playing really well defensively. However, Sugar Azucar has had a really good spring. I think he's hitting 286. Oscar Mercado, who came from the Indians, the Phillies, the Cardinals, he's hitting in the 320s with power. And they just signed a journeyman, ex-Cub, ex-Yankee, ex-Met, Tim LaCastro, He's hitting, he's got five hits in his first six at-bats, and he's got four RBIs. And in terms of guys not having good springs, we don't know about Joe Musgrove. He got knocked out of the first inning each of his two starts. Doesn't look like he's ready. Maybe he stays here as part of extended spring training. Robert Suarez doesn't look as dominant as he needs to be right now. I think he'll be there on opening day. I think it's been a good spring training camp because they've had so many of the young guys that came in the Yankee transaction and the guys they signed suddenly look like, hey, they can contribute even if it's coming off the bench, talking about Mercado, talking about LaCastro. So first half of the Cactus League, I give them a thumbs up, a lot better than I thought they would. Now, granted, it's different than opening day. That's what I say. What does Riley say? Okay. Well, let's just say this, that I think I'm excited 
about Merrill. I'm excited about Salas. I'm excited about DeVries. I think the future looks bright, but um, I'm not sure what to make of the outfield right now. We still don't have an answer for left field. He's got opinions on everything, Padres coach. Well, boy, we got a lot to chew on with that uh, gentleman. Uh, as far as left field, I think Profar, after they sign him, he'll probably be the left fielder. I I'm still concerned about center field because you're asking Ja or Jackson Merrill not only to come to the big leagues and, and be a hitter and get your feet on the ground after 800 minor league at bats, but you're also asking him, first he was going to play left field, now he's playing center, and he said the other day that he feels more comfortable in center than he does in left right now. But again, I don't know if this kid's ready, and really I think it's more than anything else the Padres. You know, are we looking to go into a rebuild with some of these young guys, or are they looking to win a – uh, a championship here. I mean, a year ago, we're talking about going to the World Series, having a parade on Harbor Drive. Now we're just trying to put together a 26-man roster to get the season underway. What are the expectations of this ball club this year? That would be a big question that I have right now. Well, a week a week from now, before they open in South Korea, we'll pick out a record and we'll talk about what we like in, in the division. That being said, I uh, they're looking for complementary parts to the four established guys that they've got who've got to hit back. Uh, that's the whole key to the Padres is the Fab Four has to hit back and it won't be Soto in the batting order. But Mercado has hit in flashes other places. LeCastro, he's been in a lot of different camps on a lot of different teams. He keeps resurfacing, which leads me to believe, John, he's probably a, a major league player or major league utility guy. So I don't think Merrill's ready, and why would you put him in there if these other guys have already got major league experience? Let Merrill just grow as an outfielder and start him at AAA or AA and just see what happens there. He's played 46 games at AA. Yeah. Okay, he's 20 years old. You know, let the kid grow and mature and get an opportunity to develop. And when you do bring him up, I mean, there's always a chance when you bring a guy up the first time that he's probably going to get shipped back at least once, if not a couple of times. But, you know, let, let's let's look at this a year from now or maybe even later this year. Now, as far as Oscar Mercado, Padres had him in AAA for a while last year. I thought they should have brought him up last year. Mm -hmm. I think right now he's won a job on this roster. As far as Lo Castro, you know, the, his greatest asset is being able to run. He stole 45 out of 50 bases at the big league level. He's like a 226 hitter. He's really a fifth outfielder. And really, to be honest with you, he's the type of guy when the rosters expand by a couple of players in September, you, you bring him up and let him be a, that extra guy that can steal a base for you if you're in a pennant race. But, okay, what what concerns you about the pitching staff? Are you as scared about this capsule thing and the fact that Musgrove has made his bones throwing hard sliders as a wear and tear factor? What do you, what do you think happens to him? How do they handle this? Because he's sure not ready, I don't think. Well, you know, he threw on the backfield the other day. And Joe had said his first couple of times out that he was working on a different slider. Now, Lee, you and John, we've all been to spring training. Okay, breaking balls in Arizona can be a little bit dangerous. I remember when Woody Williams pitched for the Padres way back when, and Woody had come out of spring training with an ERA, uh, you know, north of 30, and everybody was worried. But, you know, he'd get in the regular season and get it rolling. I think the biggest thing with Musgrove for me, get out of spring training healthy. Yep. Uh, you know, where's he at velocity wise? If his velocity's there, that slider is going to eventually come back. And I think he probably went back to throwing his old slider. And the same thing, even though you Darvish has looked really good, he's going to be 37 years of age and he's throwing a lot of big league innings. And, and when you throw in the big leagues and all those innings in Japan, they add up and you never know when a guy's going to run out of bullets. But, you know, and you brought up the point about Michael King. Michael King's a good pitcher. Yep. I mean, he did a good job last year. I think Brito's got an opportunity, even though he's going to have to get away from serving up that routine gopher ball. He gave up a few too many homers last year. Vasquez has got a chance, certainly. And Drew Thorpe in his one time that I saw him pitch, he pitched very well the other day. But again, you're asking a guy that played at three different levels last year, got to double A. Granted, he was 14 and two, only his first year of pro ball. Let's give him a little bit of an opportunity. And I could see at some point in time him maybe getting an opportunity with the big league club this year. And the relievers, Matsui and Go, they've only thrown one time each. And Matsui is is coming off this back issue. Is they think he'll be ready by the weekend. I look at these guys in a really different goal has got velocity. Matsui's got velocity and he's built like a fire plug, physical, but really small. What do you think of them? 
Uh, well, you know, I've not seen a whole lot of my, I saw Matsui throw, uh, uh, the one time out. I, I thought he looked really good. Go. I've only seen on tape. He looked awful good. I mean, I think Padre's got a couple of guys that are going to really help this ball club. Now, as far as Matsui, uh, you know, they're saying he's making progress from a back, but you know how, I mean, you could sit in a chair and stiffen up and all of a sudden you, you can't straighten up when you get out of that chair. Be interestingly with the early, uh, time to head out to Korea, We'll have to wait and see if he's on that plane. It wouldn't be surprising to me if they end up leaving him at home. We'll have to wait and see how that thing uh, progresses. Yeah, they have to they have to take 28, and then they have to cut to 26 for the games against the Dodgers. John, you sit here and listen to us smart guys talk. You're the, <laughs> you're the fan here, so give us an opinion. Well, well, first of all, I'm having microphone trouble. People are already alerting me about this. So let me fix this. You guys keep going. Okay. Next topic on the table, John. We go from Padres to Dodgers. Here we go. Here's a question, Coach. Dodgers spring training. They're nine and two right now. Dodgers unbelievable payroll. Very impressive roster. Is this season a referendum on Dave Roberts? Dave Roberts' career record is seven fifty three and four forty three. He's got a six thirty winning percentage. However, postseason. He's only 45 and 39, one World Series. In the last three years, the Dodgers have won 317 games. They've won only one playoff series, and they're 7 and 12 in the postseason with all this talent. So is it on the manager? Is it on the players? Is it on the analytics? Is this a referendum year on Dave Roberts? Uh, I don't know if it's a referendum year. I will tell you this. I think a lot of this goes to Andrew Friedman in his front office. Ah, there's a second guy in the studio that thinks the same thing. Well, I'm going to tell you why, Lee. Is I, I think, um, you know, during the regular season, I, we've seen it with a lot of teams. Like Oakland, you know, when Bob Melvin was there, you know, you can navigate through a 162-game schedule, mixing and matching guys, uh, you know, uh, over a, the long haul, but come playoff time, it's, it's a different a animal, a totally different animal. And you got to trust your players a little bit. And I think the Dodger front office, they go into those playoff games. It's too much scripted out. You got to go with your gut feeling when you, you got a big time pitcher out there, you know, you're not going to pull him after four and a third, unless he's in really dire straits. And, and we've seen the Dodgers do it and do it and well, do it again. And it looks like Dave Roberts is over managing, which he is, but he's, getting a directive from up top. And it's that simple. I think anybody that's been around the Dodgers for any length of time uh, knows exactly what's going on. I think it's more of a front office issue than it is a Dave Roberts issue. But with that being said, the offensive players, uh, I think Mookie Betts, he, he didn't get a, a hit in that playoff series last year. I, I think a lot of the players have to, uh, offensively, they've got to take the brunt of that. But as far as the way the pitching went, I'm putting that more on the front office than Dave Roberts. So do I. And it's happened, and it's happened, and it's happened. How many years in a row, how many series in a row about overuse of the bullpen, early use of the bullpen, inserting Kershaw in the bullpen, Scherzer, et cetera. But like you, I tend to think that came because it came in a memo from the analytic guys upstairs. John Riley, have you got an opinion? I do, but I don't, I'm trying to debug my microphone. Okay. Says, you guys just keep going. Okay. Final Dodger comment. So what do you think changes? Otani, Yamamoto, Glasnow, and Paxton. How really good are they going to be? Well, if they can stay healthy, they're going to be absolutely fantastic. Obviously, Otani's not going to pitch this year. And to be honest with you, Lee, even before he signed with the Dodgers last year on the talk show, I was saying, you know, whoever signed him, they ought to make him a closer. Rather than being a starting pitcher and, you know, go through all that rigmarole and, and wear and tear on him, let him close out games three days a week. I mean, one inning uh, three days a week is not going to hurt you where those innings add up. And, you know, he's got great arm action. And normally the old saying used to be guys with bad arm action, you put them in the bullpen because appearances aren't going to hurt them, but innings are. Well, Otani's coming off a, a second severe, and I don't know exactly. Nobody's seen everything's a, a secret with him. We don't know exactly what the, the injury was and what the surgery was. You know, we presumed it was Tommy John, but I don't think it was maybe uh, as serious. But you know, after two serious arm injuries, put him in the bullpen, let him swing the bat, and let him let him be your closer. Okay, we go from Dodger baseball to kind of news and notes around the major leagues. Okay, this is about what just happened this weekend and what's going to happen next weekend. We're talking about Blake Snell, still unsigned. 
We're talking about another club entering the negotiations, the Phillies. We're talking about the Giants, who looked like they were in on Blake Snell and now seem to be out on Blake Snell with the arrival of Matt Chapman. It's really been interesting, John, as, as to how this has all changed. The Phillies today signed Zach Wheeler to a $40 million extension. Now, does that take the Phillies out of Blake Snell? Because the Phillies spent a lot of money early on in the uh, offseason uh, with Aaron Nola. We don't know whether the Phillies still want to get involved with Scott Boros and Blake Snell there. Uh, the big issue is Scott Boros, if he's going to go from a seven-year offer at $210 million, if he's willing to take three years at 90, he wants opt-outs after the first and second year. Well, if I'm a GM, because he was offered by the Padres, you have to give up two draft picks to get him. And if it pushes you into the next tier in the luxury tax, you have to pay a significant tax. This is why the Yankee deal, even though it looked fascinating, doesn't make any sense. If they sign Snell to $30 million a year, they pay a $33 million a year tax per year on Snell. They lose $100,000 international signing money, and they're, they're going to lose slots in the, in the amateur draft. They drop 10 slots because of an over the luxury tax for such a, an extended period of time. Same thing with the Giants. And why would you sign anybody and give them an opt-out after the first year, considering all the things you have to forfeit, in addition to paying Blake Snell $30 million per year? So I don't know if, if Boris has overplayed his hand, if the general manager's standing up and saying, not on my watch, I'm not going to do this because of the massive cost around just the contract. It's going to be fascinating to see, and I guess the question is, is Snell – made a bad decision. Well, I, I think uh, Blake's got a lot of things on his plate. Uh, he and his girlfriend are getting ready to welcome a, a child here before too long. He's uh, up in the Pacific Northwest coaching uh, youth baseball right now. He's a good guy, Lee, <laughs> and I, I certainly wish him the very best. Uh, but, you know, I think Boris probably overplayed his hand. I mean, when you look at Blake Snell, as well as he pitched last year and, and as well as he pitched that year in Tampa when he won a Cy Young, <laughs> Those were his only two good years in the big leagues, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, up and down like the stock but market. But you know what? You, you hope that what you saw last year he can repeat. And I think Ruben Niebel did a really nice job with him. I think he was very well focused. I think he – uh, was a more rested pitcher a year ago. I know he got away from playing a lot of those video games late at night. He used a lot of energy up on that. Um, I, right now, the way things are going right now, I could see him maybe getting even a one-year deal and, and try to replay this and go for it again next year. Uh, right now, I mean, the clock is ticking. But here's the issue, Coach. Even if it's a one-year deal, somebody can afford 30, you're going to pay the contract, and you got to give up the draft pick compensation at two and a five. For one year rental, I don't think that that's not a good business venture. Well, the only way you do that is if you got a team and you feel this guy can put you over the top to where you can win the World Series. And, and what team is that? The New York Yankees. Yeah. Okay, uh, you know the Dodgers. I think they're done. Uh, I thought the Giants were definitely in play, but you know signing Matt Chapman that's probably taking them out of the Blake Snell uh, sweepstakes. And you know we keep hearing the Angels are, are kicking tires, but you know does Artie Moreno really want to do that? Does he want to get into another long term contract? So you know I think the time's running out on Blake Snell and, and Scott Boris right now. It may end up being a uh, a very short, uh, uh, maybe a three-year deal with a couple of opt-outs in it. We'll have to wait and see. And speaking of San Francisco, John Riley's team, you know, they, they signed Soler. They signed the Japanese star, Lee. Uh, and now they've signed Chapman to a three-year deal, but he can opt out after one and two, and they're going to have to give up draft picks. That's a huge gamble. And <laughs> two of the pitchers they got, Rob Ray and Jordan Hicks, have a bad history of injuries and might not be ready to start the season. So I don't understand what Zaidi has done as general manager in terms of where he's spending his resources. To me, it's kind of weird what the Giants have done. You know what's really funny to me? <laughs> you know, these opt-outs. I'm not a big opt-out guy. I mean, Bryce Harper, give him credit. When he went to Philadelphia, you go, I want to be in Philadelphia – and he had no opt-outs. Yep. Now, he wants to play till he's 40 or 41, and he'd like to probably go back to the table and, and renegotiate. But, you know, I look at a guy like Matt Chapman. Matt Chapman last year in April and May was as good an offensive performer in baseball as there was. 
And then all of a sudden the roof caved in on the last four months. He was awful. Lee. Yeah. I mean, his OPS and average, it was 216, number, 209. Was just, it was brutal. I'm a lot of swing and miss, but what cracks me up about these opt outs, the, the, it's in the player's favor. If he has a great year, he can opt out. If he has a bad year, he's he not going to opt out because nobody's going to give him any kind of contract. So that team ends up getting stuck. I mean, these opt outs are the worst thing uh, ever for a ball club. So, you know, a baseball fan, fans forum, chat room is open. Feel free to jump on board. You want to respond to what we've just said about the Padres, what we said about the Dodgers, and obviously Scott Boros. And company. So we're going from baseball. Let's go to basketball. Hot topics. We'll start in the NBA, then we'll zero in on what's gone on in the Pac 12. The Clippers need this guy. This guy reinvented himself. He's kind of a chemistry guy. And now the Clippers lose Russell Westbrook, fractured hand out indefinitely. He was a glue that kind of held this thing together. Now, there's no doubt they still got the big three. Harden, Kawhi, Paul George, you just keep your fingers crossed that nobody's breaking down final month of the season, but they're going to need bench help. They do have Norm Powell, but this to me is a really big blow. Second topic, this guy is self-destructing, setting himself on fire right in front of our eyes. We're talking about Mick Cronin in UCLA, 14 and 15 on the season. For the second time in a month, he has a terrible meltdown about his players. He says that defense that allowed 90 points a game, that's not Mick Cronin's defense. That's on those kids. And then he said, my guys need to turn the thermostat up on defense, and they've refused to do it. He says, some of you people are playing for next year. I want to see who wants to be here next year. I guarantee you, I can't build a roster around guys that won't fight. I want guys to learn to do the hard things. This was this weekend. A couple of weeks ago, he's the one that stood up and just screeched at his players, don't call your mama, and don't think about going on the transfer portal because nobody wants you. It's amazing what Mick Cronin has turned into. And by the way, you recruited him. You're responsible for him. It's your program. Coach him up. Don't beat him down. I've never seen in modern-day athletics a coach do that. And the third name is Bronny James, USC. I'm sorry. This is just starting to look like the whole Lonzo Ball era with his dad. Top, 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 top. Uh, Bronny James, he's talking about going to the NBA draft, talking about selecting a team. Why? He just got benched. He's averaging five points a game, lost his starting job with the Trojans. He's telling people, I have to see who I'm going to fit in with before I make a decision on going to the going to the draft. And he just got benched. It's like listening to Lonzo Ball and Lonzo Ball's father and how'd all that work out. So, Coach, topics on the table. Pick one. Well, I'll start with Russell Westbrook, Lee. You know, going back to watching him play at UCLA and watching his Hall of Fame career in the NBA, you know, he was with the Lakers there for a while and he took a lot of criticism and you know i watched those laker games religiously i've been a huge laker fan since i was a little boy and you know the only thing that i disliked about him when he was with the lakers i mean i never want to see him take a three-point shot ever again but uh mid-range jump shot going to the hoop fantastic player you brought up the point that you know he he changed his role and he's come off the bench and done one hell of a job. And you know, he's a good guy. He's done a lot of great charity work in Los Angeles. And you know, hopefully he can get back there because the Clippers are playing great. And I gotta man, I gotta mention the kid from San Diego from Lincoln. Norman Powell, another guy comes off the bench right now. I mean, he got serious firepower and he's a very underrated player. And then you get Kawhi and Paul George, I know, has missed a few games, and you got Harden. I mean, they've they've got the wherewithal to win this thing. Uh well, if everybody's healthy. So it'll be interesting. As far as Mick and I talked to some people at UCLA uh, earlier in the year, not recently, but it was after his first meltdown. And uh, he just having a really hard time with these guys. And he just, he, he thought they would be a lot further ahead than they are. Uh, you got a lot of European players that he's brought in. I think, uh, you know, it's been a major adjustment for them. It's obviously <laughs> been more than an adjustment for the head coach. And I mean, there's been times where UCLA early in the year played really well. Then they were just 
awful. You didn't even want to watch them play. Then they got into a pretty good spell where they won, you know, five, six, seven uh, games out of about eight. And, and now they're back to going the wrong direction again. So he hasn't handled it very well. It'll be very interesting to see who stays, who goes. Um, we'll have to wait and see on that. And the uh, last topic, Bronny James, I, I think the best thing for Bronny, I think considering his dad talks about his son a lot, I think the kid has actually done a, a pretty good job. He's a very good passer. I mean, there's some some real uh, strong points about him as a basketball player. He plays good defense. He passes the ball well. Got to definitely work on his shot. But I think uh, he, he's – hey, let's be honest. Let's be happy the kid's even able to play after that hard episode a year ago. He got a lot of work to do, and I think going to the NBA or trying to go to the NBA after one year would be a major mistake. Stay in there for at least three years. Get bigger, get stronger, get better. And then let's talk about the NBA. Have you ever seen a coach rip apart his team the way Cronin has ripped apart his team twice this year? Well, I, Bobby Knight did every once in a while years ago. <laughs> Just good comparison. Interesting. Hey, we get to halftime. Our podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center Stores. You know, there are nine locations in San Diego, whether it's kitchen counters, whether it's closet doors, whether it's flooring, whether it's new vanities. You got projects at home. Think about Dixie Line Lumber, and that includes things like doors and windows and what you're doing on your patio around the swimming pool. Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers. Our podcast also brought to you by North County Eye Center of Poway and Escondido. Comprehensive eye care, state-of-the-art technology from cataracts to glaucoma to cornea implants, extensive screening programs, vision tests, and more. The place to go, North County Eye Center, Poway and Escondido. And we're here at halftime, our Monday bonus podcast, Hacksaw, the coach, John Cantera, John Riley out in left field, his microphone's not working, but he's going to rejoin us right now. John, when we get to the finish line of today's Monday bonus podcast, tell them about Fans Forum, all the new people that are joining us on live stream. Yeah, Lee, Fans Forum is just loading up, John. You got to check this out. There's so many people that are involved. We're already highlighting names. The Winnipeg folks have rolled in, so they got more comments. If you've got a question or a comment in the world of sports for Lee or for the coach, just drop it in the live chat on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, and we'll get you involved in Fans Forum. And a reminder, if you like sports, check my website every morning. It is all written. LeeHacksawHamilton.com, and on the homepage is a big orange box. Fill it out. Register to join Hacksaw's Insiders Group as we roll out things in 2024. You'll get the alerts every time we do something. Share, tell your friends what we're doing, and subscribe every time we put something new on the YouTube channel, which is a lot of different days of the week. Ding, ding. You'll get notifications. So do all that. Give us thumbs up. You like our product, give us a five-star rating too. Okay, so we've talked a lot of different things. Let's talk about what was really cool on Sunday. And then we'll talk about the reaction nationwide Monday. We're talking basketball, college basketball. Who was better? Caitlin Clark, Pistol Pete Maravich. She broke the Division I scoring record of all time. Her, her career numbers are staggering. For the Lady Hawkeyes, she's hit 300 threes in his career. She's played 130 games. She's averaging 28 per game over the course of her career. She's got 3,685 points, and she's got nine games left. There is a small college player 
uh, in Florida, who had over 4,000 points in her small college career. Caitlin Clark playing the best against the best could break that by the time we get through the NCAA tournament. And everybody's got an opinion. Oh, who was better, Clark or Pistol Pete? Well, Pete, 3,677 points in Division I basketball. He averaged 40 points per game, but his era, they, there was no three-point shot. His era, there was no shot clock. And he only played three years where she's now completing her fourth because the redshirt rule in the NCAA was still in effect. He couldn't play as a freshman. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so tired of hearing the voices on TV argue who is better, who was better. Just appreciate the accomplishment. It's a different game. She's brilliant. He was unto himself. And the coach says, well, first of all, Caitlin Clark is an incredible player, Lee. And, and you know, the, the story about her and Maravich, I mean, it, it sounded good, I guess, on Sports Center last night. But at, at the end of the day, Pistol Pete Maravich died many, many years ago. And coaches are still telling their kids that, you know, do the Maravich drills, do this, do that. Because not only did he average, and you're kind of shortchanging him, he averaged 44.2. Okay. Okay, 44.2 for three years. Who knows what he averaged on that freshman team? I heard all kinds of stories about that. But, you know, and Dale Brown, the uh, old LSU coach, he wasn't, you know, Pistol Pete's coach there because his dad, Press Maravich, was his coach. But Dale Brown went back and had all the tapes of all the games and went back and evaluated it and said if the three-point shot would have been in effect at that point in time, Maravich would have averaged 13 threes per game. He would average 57 points a game. And not only you know was it the scoring, Lee, it was how about those acrobatic passes and his dribbling exhibition? I mean, he was a guy that everybody wanted to be like back when I was playing, uh, when I was in the 70s, you know, when I was playing high school and college basketball. I wore 44 because he wore 44 when he was playing in the NBA. I wore the wool socks like he did when I was in high school. I had a pair of socks that said pistol on them. I mean, everybody wanted to be Pistol Pete Maravich, and I'm sure a lot of the girls want to be Caitlin Clark, and she's had a great college career. She'll probably be the number one pick in the WNBA draft, and we wish her the best, but Pistol Pete, I mean, he's like a, you know, he's like an icon yep. when it comes to, you know, doing everything as a basketball player, and he did it at the highest level in the NBA. He had some great years in the NBA before his knees went bad. So you dress like Pete, but you didn't play like Pete. No, but I, I could do some of the, the goofy tricks that he pulled. And by the way, I've got all the uh, VHS tapes of Pistol Pete and his drills at home. That's cool. And Caitlin and Clark's history will be not just statistics, but her impact on college basketball across the country and what March Madness has now come for all the women in the country. It's just a phenomenal impact. They've always been really good players out there. Now we're getting to see all these players because – the colleges are recruiting them. She can flat out shoot, though. I mean, I, I don't care, man, woman, animal. She she, she does can flat out a shoot. I mean, she's six foot tall. She got a great stroke. I mean, watching her shoot, it's really pretty special. Yeah, her fadeaway jump shots, her fadeaway threes, hitting shots from the logo at midcourt. I didn't realize, you know, how tall she was yeah. really until a couple of weeks ago when I really started following, you know, I watched that LSU game last year when they got beat by LSU in the title game and all that. But, you know, I didn't realize that she was six foot tall, but man, she moves, she handles the ball really well, but she could flat out shoot. Oh, LSU, Iowa, Angel Reese rematch. Yeah. I think that's going to be fun. Okay. So we go from basketball. Let's peek inside the NFL notebook. We got all kinds of storylines around the National Football League. He has a job. Brandon Staley, fired Chargers head coach after three really substandard seasons, disappointing seasons, lousy playoff seasons, just hired his assistant head coach and will be a lead defensive guy, not the coordinator, but he'll be on Kyle Shanahan's staff. So we'll see if he is flexible. We will see if he changes everything that he refused to change with the Chargers. Because as he left, there was an undercurrent of comment that he was totally inflexible in terms of X's, O's, the use of players, etc. So we'll see if he's a different guy. He interviewed a lot of places. And he got hired. He's the last big name that finally got hired. He goes to San Francisco. The clock is ticking. We're waiting on Russell Wilson. It appears that he is going to be bought out. He is going to 
kill the Broncos. They're going to take a $45 million cap hit. Um, his his contract this year is $39.7 million. It's obvious Sean Payton with a statement Payton made last week that we have to get the next decision on the next quarterback right. That means Russell Wilson's going to exit. He confirmed this weekend he refused to change any of the language. They approached him again in the contract about injury guarantees. He said, no, the contract is the contract. It looks as if Kirk Cousins is gone from Minnesota. Uh, you know, this this guy could make $42 million this year. He's made mega money. And the Vikings have enormous problems. They got to resign Justin Jefferson. They got to resign Danielle Hunter, their top pass rusher. Cousins may be exiting, maybe going to Atlanta, maybe going to the Washington Commanders. We're also waiting on Justin Fields. Bears are shopping him hard. We hear there's now four teams that might trade for Justin Fields. The latest one to jump in would be the Raiders and the Pittsburgh Steelers, who were both rumored this weekend to having had talks at the Combine with Atlanta. This historically might be the worst contract the Chargers ever gave out. This J.C. Jackson situation, the Patriots just released him. You know, the Chargers gave him $82 million package on a five-year deal. He got $31 million of it in, for nine games. And he had a bad injury, and then he got removed from the roster, and then he got traded uh, to the Patriots. Patriots didn't take on any guaranteed money. They played him. They benched him at the end of the season. Belichick had enough. This guy, is, is, there's some mental health issues going on with him. J.C. Jackson is gone. The Chargers, get this, in addition to having paid him 31 mil for nine freaking games, Chargers take a 20 million cap hit because New England has released him. And the Chargers have big salary cap problems, and now you take that 20 on top of the 25 that they're over the cap. And so they're, they've got big issues, and there are going to be some bodies on the street corner probably within a week that the Chargers just have to let go because they can't keep them all. So, Coach Cantera, you got opinions? Yeah, no, you don't have any opinions. You got opinions. Talk about what's in the NFL notebook. Well, Brandon Staley, I'm going to have to talk with John Lynch when I get an opportunity and find out what he saw in Brandon Staley because I'll be honest with you, I saw nothing from him when he was with the uh, Chargers, the head coach. Square not, peg round hole. Well, not and then the other thing, Lee, and you know, I think he might fall into this. I don't know. Maybe he'll get another opportunity like Josh McDaniels did, and that didn't go real well over there with the Raiders. But, you know, Brandon Staley might be be a, a good defensive coordinator okay he certainly wasn't a very good head coach i think that was proven out and uh, i'm really kind of surprised the 49ers hired him now as far as russell wilson i thought russell wilson actually uh played actually pretty well last year uh was he the same russell wilson he was in seattle no but i thought as the season went on he got a little more custom uh with what peyton was trying to do i think peyton was more of a problem last year to be honest with you than russell wilson i he had a lot to fix yeah, he had a lot to fix, but I also think he came in maybe not with the, the greatest of attitudes. Not, there's been times when I thought he was maybe a little bit overrated as a head coach. But, you know, Russell Wilson, he's going to play a, a few more years, I would think, whether it's in Denver or somewhere else. Somebody will bring him on. Well, when he gets released, Denver has to pay the whole contract. Right. NFL team will sign him to a veteran's minimum. So That's somebody's right. going to get a bargain on a one- or two-year rental. And he had 24 touchdowns, I think seven picks last year in a bad situation with all the injuries around him. So I still think he's got gas left in the tank. Uh, as far as uh, Kirk Cousins, you know, got hurt there at the end of the year for the Vikings. I think Kevin O'Connell was very happy with him while he was there. Uh, you know, you mentioned Atlanta. I think that's a possibility. Uh, I've even heard if uh, Justin Fields got traded, maybe the Bears would go after Kirk Cousins. I, I don't know. You know, as far as Justin Fields, Lee, I was not a fan of his coming out of Ohio State. But I've watched him play, and I thought at times last year he played pretty well. Last year he played and I, pretty well. I think well. the biggest problem with the Bears, every year he's got a new offensive coordinator. I think he's been there three years. He's had three different offensive coordinators. Plus, they have nobody. They got one receiver around him. I DJ mean, Moore. Yeah, get him get him a little help, and that guy might be pretty good. I mean, you could bring Caleb Williams in there, and he's going to be a talented guy. I know there's some people that don't like Caleb Williams. I do. But, again, you're still going through the learning curve, and I think Justin Fields is, is more than suitable if you get him a little bit of help. And uh, as far as uh, J.C. Jackson, 
Wow, that that that's a tough one there. I mean, uh, Chargers, that's not the first bad contract they've signed. We know that. But uh, at the end of the day, I mean, a guy that just really pretty much self-destructed, and you brought up the, the mental health issues, and I, I buy into that. So lots to talk about. You're an NFL fan. I think there's a few of them out there. Join us on Fans Forum. Get into the chat box. Let's talk college football. And just a little bit off, off, off center here. The Mountain West Conference – is going to meet in their spring meetings, and they are seriously considering changing their revenue-sharing plan. At the end of the day, if, if you go to a bowl game, if you go to the NCAA tournament, you get what's called an NCAA unit. It's, it's like bonus money. But Boise State has a different contract in the Mountain West. They get additional money. That was given to them so they'd stay in the conference and wouldn't defect to the Big 12 a group of years ago. Well, now San Diego State, because of the enormous success in basketball, says, hey, if we got this rule for Boise, we need to consider this rule for everybody else in our conference. So if we get chosen for the tournament and we win the first game and go on to the second round and third round, fourth round, we get additional bonuses. Last year, the Aztecs generated $10 million in NCAA basketball units for going to the final game. They only got $1 million. They only got one share. And what's going to be kicked around and be proposed is, okay, the first lump sum unit for getting to the tournament, everybody, New Mexico gets in, Vegas gets in, Utah State, whatever, they all get a bonus for getting the tourney. All that goes into a pool, and it's divided. San Diego State is now proposing, if we win our first game and we go to the second round, we get the full bonus. That's like a million four for every game you win. So the Aztecs would have the potential of maybe getting $5 million bonus units if they got back to the final round again. So there's going to be a huge, huge discussion about that. The West Coast Conference has the same bonus plan. They they devised a couple of years ago to keep Gonzaga. They devised the same thing. Everybody gets a unit, St. Mary's, San Francisco. If they get into the tournament, everybody in the co conference gets a share of the unit. But they agreed to allow Gonzaga to go forward every round they went. And they went deep a bunch of times. They would keep the bonus units. So Mountain West and San Diego State say, hey, this is the way it's worked for Boise in football. We want the same thing for Aztecs in basketball. And it's worked successfully in the West Coast Conference. So. The model might change. My my take on that, first of all, Boise had that deal many years ago when they didn't want they wanted to keep them there. I mean, is that like a, a lifetime contract? Out. Yeah, that, that came up in a discussion. I mean, that, that needs to, to go away. Yeah. Okay, because Boise ain't the same program now that it was when they made that deal. And you know, as far as um, you know, bowl games, you know, it used to be the team that went to a certain bowl, they got a higher percentage, but then the rest of that money would be divided equally among the other schools in the conference. As far as basketball is concerned, I, I think they had to go the same way. You shouldn't necessarily get the, the entire chunk, but I, you should get a higher percentage. Uh, and then the other part of the money ought to be dispersed uh, equally throughout the course of the programs. Because really, you know, I look at the, the West Coast Conference, I mean, the rich get richer. I mean, uh, Gonzaga already has so many competitive edges. I mean, they've got their own private plane. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, they can bring recruits in. They can, you know, get home after a long road game uh, a lot quicker. I mean, you know, the rich get richer with, with deals like that. And who's to say, I mean, you know, in the days of now of gambling and uh, in, in college athletic people gambling on games, uh, who's to say that, you know, officials in, in a tight game, Gonzaga against uh, USF uh, for a team to, to go to the next round of uh, the, the conference tournament and everybody wants Gonzaga because they can make more money for the conference. Who's to say down the stretch a couple of calls go here or there? You never know, Lee. Oh, I mean, conspiracies, John. You conspiracies. know what I'm talking about. I mean, hey, <laughs> like it's not happened before. Oh, I'll leave it at that. Oh, okay, we go from that college story to the other college story. And we had this great debate, John Riley and I, last week about the playoffs. Uh, I think 12 teams is too many because we're going to wind up getting blowouts and there's going to be a lot of unhappy people. John Riley out in left field, his mic doesn't work today. That's why he, he can't he can't participate. But John Riley's the opinion. Let them all in. Anyhow, so we have a 12-team playoff that will start this coming December. 
We understand that. They are now finalizing plans for 2026, a 14 team playoff. And what they're proposing this this year's playoff will be five plus seven, five guaranteed slots for the conference champions, and then seven at large teams. And it's going to be based on the CFB football rankings. That's how they're going to pick the at large teams. Well, now they're talking in 2026, guaranteed slots. They are talking, when they go to 14 teams, they're talking three guaranteed slots for the SEC, three for the Big Ten, two for the Atlantic Coast, two for the Big 12, and one for the best team in the group of five, whether that's Mountain West, Mid-American Conference, whomever. Three at-large teams would then be chosen to fill out the 14-team field. But they've said there's no limit as to how many can come from one conference, and we'll decide with our rankings who the three at-large teams are. So, heck, we could wind up having five SEC teams. So we could have five from the Big Ten. And at the end of the day, I think the small guy kind of gets screwed, whether that's San Diego State or that's Boise State. And they're also trying to determine who's going to play where. Their theory is first round, there are buys, first round, Home field is great because they'll sell the stadium out and that'll generate more money. I maintain, John Riley disagrees with me, again, from left field. I maintain home games, first round, screw the bowls. The Holiday Bowl, Boise Bowl, Citrus Bowl, the bowls that have nice tradition do a lot in their community, they're not going to be part of this mix. I maintain the first round games should be placed, placed at the second tier bowl games to give them a big payday because they're not going to have marquee teams to go get. So that's my opinion in the anchor's chair. My co-host is out in left field. He's got his opinion, and Coach Contera says? Uh, I think 14 teams in 2026 is too many for me. Uh, if you want to go 12 and the, the first uh, four teams get a buy, uh, like they're talking, I I'm fine with that. If they weren't going to do that, then just have eight teams because I think eight's more than enough, to be honest with you, okay? Uh, as far as... Um, I think the, the first round needs to be at home because you can only ask fans to travel so, so many times. And, you know, people, they're hoping their team can get to the finals and, you know, wherever the finals is that year, they want to be able to go. You can't ask them to travel, you know, one or two or, or three weeks in a row or three out of four weeks. That's, that's unfair. If they could find a way to make the Bulls more important to where players actually want to play. And I think by having the playoffs, Lee, I, I think you're going to see less guys opt out like we did this year. If you're not in one of the top four slots, I mean, guys were opting out right and left. Yeah. I mean, you know, I give USC a lot of credit at the Holiday Bowl. They, they, You could tell, I remember sitting next to Rick Gerritsen, who coaches high school football in Arizona. I said, I go, man, Rick, I go, uh, SC really came to play. They were ready for that bowl game. They wanted to show that they were more than just Caleb Williams. And, you know, they – they they played a great game. But, and they didn't have their know, quarterback, their top two running backs, no. their two top two wide receivers all sat out. Yeah, Miller Moss came in, did a great job. But more than anything else, uh, it would really value the bowl game. So many of these bowl games now have been devalued. Oh, yeah. If you could find a way to go the direction you're talking, it would be absolutely fantastic. But again, you can't ask your fans to travel two or three weekends. I mean, people just a lot of people don't have that kind of money. Okay. Those are topics on the table. John Riley, grab that mic. You got something you want to add to this conversation here? Because you've sat here and watched from left field. Yeah, I know. I'm playing producer today. But um, I'm a big fan of 32. I want to wide open this thing up. This guy is hooked emotionally to March Madness. You can, only, you can only have players play so many games in a season. Yeah, well, maybe you have to adjust some things. But they do me, have to go to class, even though nobody <laughs> ever talks about that anymore. You got to actually go to school. Well, I, I'm just, I, I love the March Madness format. I love giving smaller schools opportunities. I love seeing big upsets. And why not? I, right now we have a two-tiered system, you know, where you've got the, the group of five or the group of five and the power five. And I, I just, I'd like to see them more intermingled. Well, you know, the unfortunate thing with the NIL, the group of five become a, a nice farm system exactly. for the power five. Everybody cherry picks everybody. Yep. yep. Now that might change a year from now. Once the new director of the NCAA gets his deal done with Congress, that may change. I'm not going to hold my breath on that. I know. Again, John Riley said, oh, the government's going to get involved? How's the post office worked out? Yeah, that's not so, Okay, it's time for Fans oh, wait, Forum. One more topic 
on the table. Oh, oh, I forgot about this. Yes. This is the last topic, and this is hard. Oh. Uh, my heart ached all day. We lost Chris Mortensen. And for those of us, like Coach and I have done talk radio our whole lives, we develop relationships with the guys at the network, and they would become our point men and our contacts and, in a, to a degree, our insiders because they had different information from different people than we had. And it was always so cool. Chris Mortensen was one of the first NFL insiders with John Clayton, and we've lost both of them within a calendar year. Uh, hell of a guy, great credibility, Christian, uh, fought an unbelievable fight against throat cancer and finally succumbed early yesterday morning. So it, it just, it, it took my heart away. He was so credible as a person and such a special guy. Uh, professionally as well as personally. Well, you bring up two great guys. I mean, yeah. John Clayton, I mean, I, I can see him sitting at Qualcomm Stadium right now behind his uh, computer typing away, He'd come up and, and talk with you. You know, Lee, you and I had John Clayton and Chris Mortensen on a lot over yeah. the years. And the thing that I always remember, I remember the guys that always took time. And, and I said that yesterday when I sent a tweet out, when I saw that Chris had passed away, he was one of those guys, you know, I was starting out, you were an established guy, but I'd call him or my producer call. It didn't matter what he was doing. He would always find the time to, to come on. And John Clayton was just like that. And for a lot of people that didn't know, you know, I, you know, uh, Chris Mortensen lived in Atlanta for many, many years. He's a West Coast guy. But he was a West Coast guy. He was born in Torrance, California. And, uh, you know, he passed away at 72. And he fought a, a hell of a fight. Great man. And, uh, you know, you, like me, man, we, we lost a, a guy that was really good to you and I. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's a third guy in the equation because I was with him every step of the way. And he's been fighting cancer. And it's been a, a monster struggle for Dick Vitale. And he was to college basketball. Uh -huh. He was the first one through the wall uh -huh. in terms of college football or college basketball. And he's fought a hell of a fight and he's still there fighting away. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you, my, and I had Dick Vitale on a few times over the years. One time when I was doing a night show after your show on 690, Dick Vitale called our hotline. And so I'd gone to a break and he got me on the phone. He goes, Hey, the Rolling Stones are coming to San Diego. Can you get me tickets? <laughs> and I go, Dick, I don't think I can get tickets for that. He goes, well, I just thought I'd try. Yeah. What a great gentleman. And he's done some unbelievable charity things. Yeah, he's he carried on for the Coach V, Jimmy Valvano fund after Jimmy passed from cancer. So we've lost a couple of really good guys in the media. Now – it's time for John Riley's favorite segment because of these are all his friends who've joined us from left field with their questions and their comments. Go ahead, John, pick a few. Let's see what they've got to say, and we'll see what a roundtable has to say. Okay. Well, first of all, there's a lot of people that are just loving having Coach here. You know, they're just loving to see the two of you together. Uh -huh. So let's uh, let's take a look look at some of these comments here. This is from Art Vandelay. It says, "So great to see two legends, Hacksaw and Coach Gintera." Um, then Callan, uh, Max sports says, um, some San Diego and SoCal sports talk radio legends on the air today. Great to see you coach. Yeah. Maybe we should start maybe. our own show every day. Uh, <laughs> hey, maybe. Thank you. Um, uh, let's go here to Michael. He says, uh, any chance the Padres could re-sign Blake Snell. Very interesting that he is not signed so late in spring training. Well, they only have $18 million left. They, their, their payroll right now is 149. It's 101 million below what it was a year ago this time. They can't go over the first threshold. They've already, you know, this has been a brutal year. They lost the $60 million TV contract coach. They owed MLB $40 million in penalties. They they have to stay below. And it's obvious with the pass in Peter Seidler that they've decided to take the budget even farther down. So they can't get they won't get involved with Blake Snell. They had an opportunity. They offer him $20 million when they qualified an offer to him and they responded in a negative fashion immediately. So that's not going to happen. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, this Blake Snell thing is every day that goes by, I'm finding it more and more fascinating because, you know, even though he's been working out uh, up there in the Pacific Northwest, I know he's been coaching a bunch of kids. His dad, I think still coaches like youth league baseball up there. Um, you're, you're not thrown to a major league catcher. You're not in major league camp. And, you know, a lot of times, Lee, when even the old guys are working out, then they come into camp late. 
they're always playing catch up and then they try to do too much and they have a setback, you know, a sore elbow or a sore shoulder or something starts nagging. And right now I think Blake Snell, unfortunately, is kind of setting himself up for a bad season. Yeah. And he's had erratic seasons sandwiched around the two unbelievable Cy Young Award seasons. You and I are both baseball junkies. I tell John Riley this all the time. We have not seen a pitcher this dominant, 1.20 ERA from May 1st on, this dominant since Bob Gibson in 1968. Uh, His ERA was 1.12, I believe. Yeah, Bob Gibson. Uh, I, I got his autograph once upon a time. Boy, uh, I was kind of scared to ask him for an autograph, but he ended up being a really, really nice man and started asking me if I played baseball and all that. I met him out at La Costa during the old Astro Jet where uh, they used to have uh, major league players and um, – NFL players. I got Mickey Mantle's autograph, Willie Mays autograph all in the same day, but Bob Gibson was really cool. But, you know, as far as Blake Snell, you know, I know they used the walks against him last year. He walked 99, led yeah. all of baseball, but then you take a look at his ERA. I mean, that shows you just how dominant he was. He walked 99 guys last year and only 12 guys scored. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Next question. Okay. Let's, uh, Actually, I want to get this one in here. It's, it's about Blake Snell, but this is from Co Cody. And I want to thank him for the $5 Super Chat donation. He says, hope all is well. What are you hearing with Snell? Are the Yankees truly in the race for him or being used to higher the price? Well, as we alluded to in the early segments, the problem with the Yankees is they, they did offer him a six-year 150 deal. It was rejected. Uh, Scott Boris came back and said, we wanted opt-outs. And the Yankees said, if we sign him, we have to pay a $33 million tax penalty on that contract every year. We have to forfeit two draft picks. We have to forfeit international money. We don't want to have to give that up with the risk that he could opt out. No opt-outs at Yankee Stadium. So that's why he's not signed there. The Phillies reportedly made contact over the weekend, Coach. All of a sudden, Philadelphia gave the mega contract early this morning to Zach Wheeler. They look out of it. The Giants have spent a lot of money. But they got the same opt-out problem that you're going to get a guy for one year uh, at a lower price, and then you're forfeiting draft picks to have him vacate. Uh, uh, the way Scott Boris is doing business, I don't think it represents the best situation for Blake Snell because most everybody's money is spent. When this free agency uh, got underway, Lee, and John, I, I thought that Blake Snell, you know, when I heard about the Yankees and you heard about the Phillies and you heard about the Dodgers initially before they went after Yamamoto, I thought he was going to go to the Giants. And, so did I. And I'm, you know, even though they've signed Soler and they've uh, signed Chapman, they brought, brought the center fielder in from uh, Korea. Uh, I, I'm, I would, they've got to do something up there even more to get that fan base back. They had a lot of empty seats last year and they've had the last couple of years. It wouldn't surprise me if they worked out a deal, but I, I still think the Yankees might come back with a shorter deal and try to get him in under their uh, Yankees. Their farm system is pretty frugal right now, and they could afford to give up a, a draft pick here or there, I think. But as far as luxury tax, I don't think anybody wants to pay that. But you know, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes, how long he's going there for, and how well he produces in his first year with this late start. And this is a different environment to pitch at Yankee Stadium than pitch in small market San Diego and, and where you know, everything is beautiful. And, huh? and the thing is with him, he's a guy about being comfortable. And, and going to Yankee Stadium, I, even though he's pitched there a lot when he was with Tampa, I, I don't know if day in and day out if he wants to live in New York and live that kind of life. And he's it's fascinating. A guy. Fascinating. Juan Soto goes there. He thinks this is going to be easy. Yeah, he's there for one year. If he's there and hits 226, it's not going to be like being in San Diego hitting 226 yeah, you for the first half of the season. fly balls to right field to go out in that ballpark. Good deal. We move on. Next question. Okay. Um, Let's, uh, I, Art Vandalay jumped in here again. Another super chat donation. Thank you, Art. Because I love Coach. Don't you agree that we should sign Bauer? All those women are liars. Also, what's your opinion on Kim refusing to learn English? Well, boy, that's a hot button. This might explode a bunch. We might melt the computers down now in addition to John's microphone. Um, Bauer has paid a terrible price for stupidity. Bauer can pitch. You'd have to explain yourself to your fans and society. But if it's all about winning and you can formulate a contract that keeps him on the straight and narrow because he's got to reestablish his credibility as a pitcher, but also as a person. 
I would take a run at him. John and I have argued back and forth. I think the Angels, who really need a front-end guy, should take a run on a one-year contract with Bauer because he's 83 and 56 as a starter. Is he a flake? Yeah. Has he got himself involved in a bunch of junk? Yeah, I would do that. And in terms of the, the, the I had an issue in the Padre clubhouse. And there was, there was one stretch two years or three years ago that 18 of the 25 guys didn't speak English because of the tremendous Caribbean connection. And I don't understand why these guys don't want to learn English a, to make it easier, but also to make themselves a marketing gem because now you're a two-language guy. So why, why, why do they need to be a marketing gem when they're playing for – they're already making big money? Because it's all about the bank. Okay, your thoughts on Bauer? Uh, well, if I was the general manager of the Padres, I would do my due diligence on that. I, I would uh, look uh, – in. The, I mean, you're looking for ball players in any way you can get them. And I mean, there's a lot of baggage there. Uh, that girl's from San Diego that uh, he was involved with. Uh, he, he's a knucklehead. There's no question about it. He's a, he's a big knucklehead dating back to his days at UCLA, for that matter. I don't, I don't think he had any type of these problems back there. Uh, but, you know, uh, he's not behind bars. Uh, I do think, and I'm a big believer that uh, people do deserve second chances. I'm not sure the Padres want to deal with all the PR. They've got enough of problems trying to put their 26-man roster together. And I don't know if they want to. Uh, and, you know, I think the other thing, if I was a general manager, I got to go to my my leaders of my ball club. I got to go to Bogarts. I got to go to Machado. And I got to get a little bit of a, a feel on how they would feel because they're the ones that are going to have to be on the fire line. And, you know, I can do the press conference, but day in and day out, I'm not going to necessarily step to the mic. But, you know, people are going to be in that Padre club house and every player on that team is going to have to answer you know what do you think about trevor bauer so it'll be interesting i do think he's going to get an opportunity it may be a little bit of a late start but i don't disagree with you going to anaheim may not be the the worst uh, case scenario because of the the media market there but i think that story here to san diego a little too close to home i think for the padres to go that direction and i don't think they want to deal with the pr considering they're just trying to get their their ball club together john carry on next question here okay um, let's go here to, uh, to Neil. And this is a great comment. He says, it feels great hearing saw and coach on the same blowtorch again. Thank you. YouTube <laughs> and Facebook just need to get Kaplan and Darren Smith. <laughs> Tell you what, John and I have talked radio for a long time because if you stay in one place long enough, they are going to get you. They be in management. Um, and we've talked about all the really good people that are quote free agents. Some are doing these, some are out of the business completely. It's too bad. And I'll, I'll just make this comment. Historically, I have so many broadcast people, broadcast people from outside San Diego who've always come to me and said, 690, what you guys built, how did you do it? And it was just a combination of a wide variety of confluences that fell into place. Ownership that loved sports talk radio. It was the beginning of sports talk radio. We were the first one on the street corner to do that type of sports talk radio. And they fell into hiring really quality guys that evolved. I mean, you you think back. I was the first one, first component. And then you think about how they hired other people. You know, you came on a, a bit later with your repertoire of high school football. Steve Hartman was not the guy they were supposed to hire. They were supposed to hire Bud Ferrillo. They right. hired Hartman from L.A., and then they hired Chet Forty from New York. And after Chet passed, I introduced them to Philly Billy Wernell, and we were off to the races. And there was, you know, and then Jim Rome came as a nighttime sports reporter, then a sports talk show host, then a weekend guy, and he became a mega superstar on the network. And we had Mason in Ireland and some other really good guys. I don't think it was by any grand design. I think they knew because I was the first guy coming in. They knew what they wanted to do. And then they came upon all these different people. And you look back at the run we had from, when did it launch? 1990? 1990. From 1990 till, unfortunately. My last day at 690 was uh, December 27th, <laughs> uh, 2002. And that's what our contracts weren't renewed. And, uh, 
you know, but Lee 690 was special and it'll never be recreated. I mean, you mentioned the guys and, you know, we're, we're friends with all those guys to this day. And and I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with the listeners. Not everybody always got along there. Hell no. <laughs> I mean, we, everybody was fighting. I mean, there was no Twitter. There was no, uh, uh, I mean, the internet kind of was starting to come in, uh, in the, you know, mid to late nineties, but I mean, we had to grind, we had to spend a lot of time on the phone. I mean, you were always on the phone. I was always on the phone. Everybody was on the phone that wanted to get quality top notch stories. And, you know, there was a competitiveness between all of us, quite frankly. I mean, we wanted to get the story right. And everybody was competing and, you know, everybody wanted to know what you were doing with the high speed sports wire and all that stuff. And, you know, I'd come in and uh, after you at night and, you know, stories would be coming down, you know, at eight o'clock at night and I'd be on top of that. But, you know, that was a unique group of guys. And then, you know, when 690 went away, John Lynch's non-compete uh, was over and we, uh, you know, most of us went back to work, uh, in, in March of 2003 until, you know, I stayed there, uh, until 2015 and I went and did some other things and then had my last radio gig. So, you know, it's been interesting, met a lot of great people and, you know, Kaplan, uh, you know, Scotty and, and Darren, I had a good conversation because I filled in on uh, Darren's show a couple of weeks ago uh, and those guys are doing well. Yeah. It's fascinating to think back and all the people, the radio industry people from the outside, I interact with these people and say, how did you get there? How did you do this? What made it work? Well, it was a combination of a lot of hard work. That's for well, sure. Well, yeah. And we, and we never, I don't think any of us at 690 thought we would leave a legacy behind that we did. And we really did. And it was right group of guys, some by design, some they fell into and discovered right signal 77,000 watts i mean i got people to this day that listen to us in oregon and the state of washington Absolutely. up in vancouver and having the right play by play and our team quote the chargers got really good and our team the aztecs had the historical run with marshall falk and we were all wrapped around that so it's interesting to hear uh, from people out of town in radio radio executives program directors that i interact with that say how did you guys do this? Because it's never, it, everybody's tried to do it and nobody's ever been able to recreate what we did. Nine hour game days, NFL draft shows. And, you know, I love those draft shows. You know, broadcast from spring training in the Cactus League or when I got to go to Vero Beach. I mean, it was just at Dodger Town. It was just. Yeah, I thought the 690 guys, when they sent you to Vero Beach, they told me they sent you on a one way ticket. We didn't expect you to come back. I came back on the plane. I saw the ratings without me, felt I'd need to bail them out a second time. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was really, really special. So that's the great heritage, even though we're doing something really different now. Uh, with podcast and and we have Zoom and we have all. Yeah, the, you talk sports. A lot of these shows now don't talk sports. They talk to each other about non important stuff. Yeah, amazing. Couple more here before we put the lid on this, John Riley. All right, uh, let's talk a little Dodgers here. We'll go to Dave, and he says, "In the postseason, Dave Roberts takes his orders from the computer brains up in the GM's office. The Dodgers are like a video game team. Dave Roberts is a hell of a manager. He manages egos really well. Yeah, he does. And that, now." There have been issues. I, I was just aghast at what's happened in postseason play, the use of the pitching staff, who got yanked early, who got shoved into the bullpen in a different role, et cetera. That's bothersome. I don't know if that's ever going to change because that seems to be the way organizations are running organizations now, the analytic guys. Yeah, well, you got a lot of people that have never played the game. Uh, they're they're playing uh, video games up there, and, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, I think all of us old school baseball people, we got to face it from time to time. And some of those numbers really do tell you a good story, but at the end of the day, they don't tell you what's in your chest or in between your ears. So, uh, you know, you got to go with your gut feeling. I mean, that's why Bruce Bochy is so successful. Bochy, uh, there's nobody that handles a bullpen better than Bochy. He does a great job handling a pitching staff. And at the end of the day, I guarantee in the World Series, he may be looking at numbers for matchups or his relief pitchers against certain hitters. But at the end of the day, he wants to put a guy out there on the mound that can get people out. And he's going to go with his old gut feeling. From the gut. Uh, absolutely, 100%. Next question, John Riley. Let's move on here. Okay. Well, um, here's a fun one here. And this is, uh, this is from Normal Heights. And, Coach, I'll let you read this one. You can see that? Yeah. 
normally I'd be happy with the Dodgers. No, no, no. Oh, right here, right here. Oh, it was... says you got to have some veterans coming off the bench. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that's a, you know what? People uh, joke about that, but I've, I've been around baseball my entire life. Uh, you know, even before I got in to, to broadcasting, I mean, that's what I did for a living for a number of years, coached high school, college, uh, worked as a professional scout for a couple of different organizations, evaluating players. And I watched a lot of players over the years come up from the minor leagues and, and they don't get an opportunity to get those four at bats every night. They're getting that one at bat in a critical situation against a closer and you're setting those guys up to fail. If you're going to bring a young kid up, you got to throw him in there, let him get 12, 15, 20 at bats. If he's over 20, he's over 20, but you got to let that guy go back to the clubhouse and know the confidence his name's going to be in that lineup again uh, the next night. And uh, that's why I think if you've had guys on the bench that have been there, done that, they can make the adjustments. They've shown they could make the adjustments over a number of years at that level. And that's why it's crucial to have good, solid guys that have been there, done that coming off the bench, not some rookie up from El Paso. And the key word in the conversation is chemistry. Oh, chemistry is a big part of it. And, you know, I, you know, everybody now, because Bob Melvin's no longer here, everybody wants to point the finger. Melvin didn't do this. Melvin didn't do it. Bob Melvin's a good manager. Mike Schilt's a, an outstanding manager. And, you know, they may be saying the same thing about Mike Schilt two years from now if they don't win or get to where they want to go. But, you know, Bob Melvin, there's nothing wrong with Bob Melvin. He did a good job. And I think the players, uh, they, they like playing for him. I don't think he grinded on them. Some managers will grind on you. I don't think Bob Melvin was a grinder. I think he got frustrated at times with upstairs uh, with, with upstairs. I, absolutely. And you know what? General managers and managers, they have a tendency to butt heads because they're competitive and everybody in baseball or in sports, they always think they're right. And, you know, that's why when Kevin Towers and Bruce Bochy were here, not that they wouldn't get in arguments and that, but those guys were like the best of friends and they always worked it out and they always had the, the ball club uh, as the number one priority, not their egos. Okay, a couple more here. Fans forum and social media, John Riley. Yeah, I just, first of all, I just want to say this is awesome. You know, to have the two of you together, because there's so many people in fans forum and that are all freaking out. And I'm only cherry picked a few people. I mean, there's hundreds of people in this chat line right now. Um, and they're all loving seeing the two of you guys together. So this is cool. I haven't seen Saul in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's good. Good to see him. All right, let's go here to, uh, let's talk to like some of our, our uh, fans up in Canada have some comments here. And it says, uh, from Matt, what do you think about the trades the Raptors have made? Will Canada's team become a contender anytime soon? Well, they've shifted a lot of players. They've run a lot of players out of Toronto. I was kind of absolutely stunned that the Raptors got rid of Fred Van Vliet. He wound up in Houston and has done some really good things. Of course, prior to that, Kawhi Leonard exited too. Uh, it's, it's intriguing. I mean, they keep trying to make deals that keep churning it. Uh, they're good, but they're not Boston. No. Oh. They're good might not be the L.A. Clippers. Um, I mean, we saw what Boston did to the Golden State Warriors over the weekend, beat them by 52, I yeah, think. Yeah, they were up at like by 46 at halftime. Yeah, I just, watched part of that game. Yeah, John was in a foul mood. I couldn't even get him to text me back. That was unbelievable. In the yeah. course of that. So, you know, the NBA is all about the big three on all these star clubs. I think the NBA's got a problem, John. Uh, first of all, style of play. Uh, defense has become optional in the NBA. That's a negative. I think the other thing is now the players and the agents run the league. Adam Silver doesn't run the league. The general manager of your team doesn't run the league. Everybody's got to have a big three. So therefore, you got five clubs that have big three stars, and you got 25 other teams that have no prayer, no chance. Rich Paul and Clutch Sports, they yes. seem to be making the rosters for everybody these days. So it's a that the NBA landscape has changed. And I don't, you know, once once the toothpaste is out of the tube, I don't think you get it back in. And I don't think the NBA reels the sport back into control. I mean, there's some incredible players. I mean, Steph Curry is the greatest shooter I've ever yeah. seen. I mean, he and how quickly he shoots. I mean, he barely gets the ball in his hand and it's it's off. I mean, LeBron James is incredible i mean at 39 years of age doing what he's doing i'm a big strong guy i mean there's some incredible players right now but man they don't play hard night in night out they don't play tough hard-nosed defense and anytime you hit a guy above the shoulder you got to go over and have a replay i mean i mean i wonder what like guys like rick mahorn and, and bill lambeer when they they, they see it. They used to crush guys going to the basket. Bad I mean, boys. They'd, they'd be uh, over there looking at that replay for 48 minutes during a basketball game. It's just a different game, but not real physical. And, you know, I was watching the other night because everybody's been talking about how many points are being scored. 
Well, you know what? Guys are going to be able to get jump shots if you lay off them by six feet. You got to get right up in their chest and make them go around you or at least work for that jump shot. The problem is there's so many great athletes who are so quick, they will go around you. Yeah. Now, whether or not they get killed in the paint, that's another discussion. John, what else you got there? Okay, just got a few more here to get to. Um, and again, I, there's just so many people here that are just so stoked to see, you know, Coach and Hacksaw. Here's Gary. He says, Coach, keep Coach a three-guy Monday night football <laughs> style. And I got a few more here that I want to get to get on. He says, great to see Coach and Hacksaw back together again. Um, where was another? There was another one here that a guy had a comment about. Um, oh, where was it? It was, he said he remembered seeing you playing basketball at Peterson gym at UCSD, I guess at some promotion back well, in played, the day. I played in a couple of charity games. Uh, uh, there were a couple at UCSD and there was another one at San Diego state. I, I played, uh, uh, for a cancer, a guy, uh, Cordy Miller, who played for me at Torrey Pines. He went on and played at San Diego state for four years. He had a, um, a game three years for, uh, for, to raise money for cancer. One of those games, Mark Harmon from NCIS, uh, the former UCLA quarterback, mm -hmm. he, he played in that game. Chris Dudley played in that game. The late Sean Rooks, who played in the NBA in Arizona, was in that game. We had a bunch of different people. It's kind of a funny story. Sean Ricks, one year we were playing what is Lion Tree Arena now, but it was um, Remax Center when they first opened it. And uh, we were playing, and, you know, I hadn't played in a number of years, but, you know, I went out there and supported Cordy. And Chris Dudley, who played a long time in the NBA, went to Torrey Pines. I'm playing with Sean Rooks. Me and Sean Rooks are on the same team, and Dudley's playing on the other team. So Dudley goes to go for a rebound. Dudley's about 6'11". You know, I'm 6'7". And uh, so I, I box him out real good, and he goes, God, John. He goes, take it easy. I go, hey, Dud, I may be slow, old, and fat, but I'm not going to let you get the better of me tonight. And what was kind of funny, when I was first got into coaching, I was still in college at USIU, and I was coaching baseball at Torrey Pines. And during lunchtime, we would always play pickup games with the coaches and, and the better players at Torrey. You know, we play for 30 minutes, pretty get a pretty good run in. And Chris Dudley was a young kid. He didn't play varsity basketball at Torrey Pines until he was a senior and ended up going to play for Dick Cooch and uh, at Yale. But Dud would always sit in the stands and drink his little carton of milk and his little brown bag lunch with his high tops on, and nobody'd ever pick him because he wasn't a real good player. And then, then a guy ends up going and you know playing a dozen years in the NBA. And he, he lives in San Diego, and he's a great guy. It's speaking of Torrey Pines, isn't and we've John and I have talked about this. Isn't a Scott Pollard story oh. unbelievable? I I texted him and I sent yeah. him some videos of Scott Pollard having a heart transplant, and then he had setbacks. He had two more procedures. Now, this week on the weekend, he checked out of the hospital yeah. with the whole hospital staff walking down the hallway, and he rang the bell at the Vanderbilt Saw Medical that. Center, and it is so moving. So you know, it was cool. Well, I'll tell you, Scotty came to Torrey Pines. I coached as one of his older brothers. He had uh, several brothers, and they all played college basketball, but Neil Pollard was one of his brothers, and he played for us. Uh, his senior year at Torrey Pines, and we had a great team. We won our league title. We went like 28 and three, and he was a seven footer. And then Scotty came a few years after that, and um, there were a lot of things that went on. Mr. Pollard had passed away. He was working for the Solana Beach, uh, the city of Solana Beach, and he passed away. And and the family moved up to Washington for a short period of time. So he played his junior year at Torrey, didn't play his senior year, but then came back and played. After basketball, he transferred back to Torrey so he could graduate from there. Uh, and I remember I was coaching baseball at the time, and I heard this knock on the locker room door. So I ran down there. All of a sudden, it's Scott Pollard. He was trying to get in the, the boys' locker room at like, you know, 1030 in the morning. Hey, Scotty, welcome back. And, you know, he's a great kid. The kids at Torrey Pines absolutely loved him when he played there. He was just a good guy. Family were good people. And uh, that really saddened me when I heard that story, you know, about three months ago. Um, but you know, it, 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 the way that story started out, looks like there's going to be a very happy ending. Yeah, and the NBA interceded. They could not find a heart donor because he's such a big man at 6'11", yeah. 270. They needed a special type donor and the NBA used its medical contacts to find the heart. And I mean, I, I was shocked. He got, he looks really good too. Yeah. He they had the surgery of Friday night at Vanderbilt Saturday morning. I saw a video of him actually standing with all the medical trees. He's a big boy to get up. And walking. And his wife kept sending future videos. And then, then there were setbacks. And she'd alert us to the setbacks. 
and to see him walk down the hallway at the medical center with on this girls, past week, yeah. yeah, with his kids and ringing a bell, which means I'm going home. Just amazing. Now, setbacks can still occur. Rejections can occur. But boy, what he's accomplished in the last couple of weeks. But and, looking at the, looking at his face. Yeah. I mean, big difference. I oh, mean, yeah. just a big difference. And that's the smile I remember when he was a 15, 16 year old kid at Torrey Pines High School. Okay. John Riley, got a couple more you want to get to here. I do. Um, I got a couple more people that are just so excited to see the two of you together. Um, Charlie Long says, Coach Cantera and Hacksaw has to be the Mount Rushmore of San Diego Sports Radio. Yeah, damn right. And then over here, Tracy says, Hacksaw and Coach Cantera, fond memories. Um, Jeff says, man, Coach was right. So-called sports talk now has become music trivia games, favorite restaurant food reviews, and daily daily tw Taylor Swift Kelsey updates. Give me back the 690 days. There's so much noise out there. That's the problem. Is how do you pick and choose? When we did it, we were the first one on the street corner to do it, and that's that's what made it uniquely exceptional. You know, Lee, my, my thoughts on it, I mean, everybody does their show differently. Um, you know, you and I maybe are a little... Uh, old school. Well, old school, <laughs> but, I mean, we love sports. Yeah. I mean, we still get excited about going down and watch a San Diego State football game on a Saturday night where a lot of people nowadays... You know, they'd rather, you know, either watch it on TV or go to a cocktail party. And I've never been that way. You've never been that way. Um, and I think there's still some guys on the air or, you know, locally as well as uh, nationally that still, you know, really love sports for what sports is all about. But there are also a lot of guys doing what we do now that don't know. Masquerading. Well, a lot of them never even wore a jock strap, to be honest yeah. with you. And, and they are masquerading. And that's why they don't like to take a lot of phone calls. So, uh, it was a different time. We did a really good job at what we did. Would have been nice to be appreciated. Do you know, and I, I mentioned this to Coach, so I spent 28 years doing sports talk radio here, San Diego, 690, 1090. And then I went and did stuff for three years on the baseball channel on Sirius XM. Not one of the guys that I worked for, talking management, not one of them said, thank you, good job. How, how can that be after you put up ratings and revenues and you do all this? In my lasting moment, when my contract expired finally at 1090 and be prior to that 690, was walking into the general manager's office and we're making a change. Here's the brown envelope sign here. Huh. That's my that's my lasting memory of working for management. Jeez, that's too bad. It just shouldn't. I don't think it should be that way. Yeah, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, we've all been there. If you haven't been fired uh, or let go uh, from radio, they say you haven't really been in radio. Long or enough. it's coming. Yeah, or it's coming. So, hey, onward and upward. Life is yep. good. And uh, it's been uh, great. Uh, you got a couple more there, John. I'm kind of enjoying this. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. All right. Let, maybe it's some social you media comments. My wife is very happy that I'm talking with you guys today. She's tired of me giving her scores and rundowns of all the Lakers or the Padres and spring training. I know. It's on social media. You always believe what's on social media, right? Yeah. She, had, she tweeted out, get him out of my kitchen. Yeah. All right. Let's go here and get some social media comments. Uh, yeah, look, talk second chances. I thought this was a good one um, from Sharon. He says, you keep giving these guys a second chance, you know, talking about Ariza and Bauer. Um, you send a message to every single person that you can get away with bad behavior if you were good enough. Well, the, the only response would be these guys did pay a price. You know, Bauer lost all of his endorsements. He lost $31 million in salary. He has lost two years of athletic ability. You don't get back. Ariza's lost two years of pay. Two years of athletic ability, as good as he might be with Kansas City, that's two years of athletic ability, earning power, and playing in a league you can't get. They paid a price for the stupidity. I I went crazy. John had to sit me down, Coach. Uh, you know, I said my whole life's been in the National Football League. I can go through every roster, and I can tell you the guys that really committed some serious offenses that are playing in the NFL. DUIs, domestic abuse, guns, cocaine, PEDs. They paid a penalty. They're back. I thought Ariza got blacklisted. I thought he got blackballed. I thought it was a real shame. And since when, and this will be insulting to say, and I've said it before, since when is being stupid the thing that keeps you out of the NFL? Ariza, what he did 
was stupid at the point of a senior season. But I look at the rosters in the NFL, and there's a lot of guys that are really bad things. have been charged, convicted, served time, and are back in the league. That kid should have been allowed back in the league. Once the Chargers were dropped, the lawsuits were settled. Well, neither one of these guys have ever been incarcerated. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, uh, it comes down to the discretion of an organization if they want to go that direction. Kansas City, obviously, uh, you know, watched, uh, you know, they're, they're personnel people. I mean, all these personnel, they've been watching what's going on here in San Diego. And, you know, uh, I, I'm a big believer in second chances. But, uh, you know, you got to you've got to still do your due diligence. You just don't say, hey, this guy's going to get a second chance. You got to do your your work behind the scenes before you ever give him that second chance. All right, John, next question. Next social media comments. Sure. And and for the record, I'm, I'm supportive of Bauer and Ariza being back. OK, let's go here and talk about the NFL draft and uh, talk about Derek May. Um, uh, or not Derek May, what Drake, Drake May, Drake, Drake May. May, pardon me. May's game is a combo of Rivers and Ben. The funny footwork, throwing motion, and release of Rivers, the size, strength, and athleticism of Ben. He had to do a lot of that creative stuff, and he looks funky uh -huh. at times because he wasn't on a great team. He made that North Carolina team a really gifted team. You put him in a structure. Look at Roethlisberger became coming out of Miami of Ohio. He was just a wild arm kid who was big and could run some, and they made him a great quarterback in Pittsburgh. It, it took him 18 months, two years, two seasons to finally become special. So May May could be the next, John and I talked about this last week, the next coming to Ben Roethlisberger. And I would assume he's going number two right after Caleb Williams. Well, I would certainly think. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, talking to Tom Telesco at the Holiday Bowl yeah. a couple of years ago when North Carolina was here and they played Oregon. Um, Telesco was there that night, and I guarantee he was he wasn't there to watch anybody else other than that quarterback. And you know, I, I do agree with you, Lee. He'll be the second player taken uh, behind uh, Caleb Williams. But I like him. I think he can move around well. He's got a really good arm, and looks like he's got good vision. It looks like he sees the field pretty well. Also, yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens in number three. Jaden Daniels has rocketed the charts. He was kind of a one man gang at LSU. I don't I just, know. People I, are saying he's the third third player in the pick. I said. Boy, I don't know. I don't see it myself, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think those other two guys I feel a little more comfortable with. And then further down, I'm a big Bo Nix fan, but he's a systems quarterback, and I like Michael Penix. I don't know if Penix is Tua, but he sure won a lot, and he sure made a lot of plays, and he didn't have a great team around him to begin with. I like Penix better than I like Bo Nix. Bo Nix is older, and I, I don't know. I just don't see him being a starting quarterback in the National Football League, and I'm not sure I see Penix being a starting quarterback in the NFL. And J.J. McCarthy? Uh, well, Jim Harbaugh thought he was going to be the first player taken. and I, I don't see it. I mean, you know what? Throwing outside the numbers for him, I mean, he, he's got a good arm, but I don't think it's a great arm. And, you know, I go back uh, and I realize guys get better and, you know, always are constantly, you know, evaluating them and reevaluating them. But you go back to that playoff game against TCU uh, two years ago, man, that, that ball was going the other way because he's trying to throw those deep outs and he couldn't get it there. So I, I don't know. He's a pretty athletic guy. Maybe if he goes to the right organization, but I, I can't imagine him being a first round draft. Pick. I didn't think so either. And as I, I told John Riley, um, he was surrounded by studs. Great running game, yeah. pretty good wide receivers, great defense. An offensive he, line. He wasn't carrying the burden of the world on his shoulders. He was just doing what he had to do because there were so many other good people around him that did great things. So, John Riley, this has been spectacular. Oh, yeah, yeah. This has been fun. I want to remind you, our podcasts brought to you by North County Eye Center, Poway and Escondido. You need help with your eyes? You need North County Eye Center. And by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers, nine stores in San Diego. You got projects to get done. You need Dixie Line Lumber. John Cantera, this was fun. We might have to have you back. A bunch of people have an outpouring. Think we ought to be doing this every day. That's a lot of extra work. But uh, John Riley, we apologize that your microphone in left field didn't work, but you'll be back with us too. And a reminder Thursday. Uh, right before the NHL trading deadline, we will be talking a chunk of hockey, too, for our O Canada fans that join us every Monday and Thursday. Hey, next time I come, and I don't know when that'll be, but I'm going to wear my New York Rangers jersey. That's cool. Huh? I'll wear my Maple Leafs jersey, and Dummy here will wear his California Golden Seals clothes. I know in your second coming, you want to be Terry Sawchuck. No. 
came from a hockey background, probably go back to a hockey background. Coach, it's been great. Hope you've enjoyed this. This is kind of cool. We'll get the opportunity to do this again. Oh, it's great, Lee. Thanks for the invite, and uh, thanks to Mr. Riley. What a what a great setup you guys have. And thanks to you for being with us on Monday Bonus Podcast. We'll see you come Thursday. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com. 